book of 2 John. I'm going to read two verses this morning. Verse number 5, the Bible says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which ye have, we have heard from the beginning, that ye love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Now, clear up a few things. Verse number 1, you find that the elder, that's the Apostle John, referring to himself, unto the elect lady, who's that, that's the church. Okay, and unto the elect lady and her children. Who's that? That's the members of the church. Okay, he's not writing this letter to a literal lady and her children in her household. This is written to the local church, which is why it's an epistle, if you look at the second epistle of John. Okay, a letter written to the local church and to the members of the church. So, now we got that cleared up. It says, and now I beseech thee. The word beseech means to beg, to implore, to charge another person. He's both saying, it's your duty, but I'm also begging you to do what I'm about ready to write. It's okay, Vander. I can out-preach you. I promise. But, I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee. He's saying, what I'm begging you to do, what it's your duty to do, is not anything new. I mean, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, go over to Ecclesiastes, read, I don't know, about the first six chapters, you're going to come to the same conclusion that Solomon did. There's nothing new under the sun. God's expectation has always been the same from the beginning of time until the, you know, omega of eternity. God's expectation was one thing, holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. When man sinned, he was no longer holy. Christ came so that we could be redeemed and robed in his righteousness, and one day we'll get a body like his, we'll be holy. Right? And so shall we ever be with Christ. Amen. But God's expectations and commandments are not like the world's commandments, where things change. Used to, soap was enough to kill an outbreak of the flu, but no, we had to walk around with mask on for forever because people too stupid to, you know, if you're sick, stay home. Okay? That's why y'all had to do that. But anyway. Second thing, that God's commandments not only do not change, God's commandments don't even, you know, evolve. Right? One of the beauty of the, the American Constitution is that they allowed and set a provision forth for amendments. Well, what's an amendment? That means you add something or change something that was written in it, and it's just like it was there for the entirety of it, just like it was there from the beginning. To amend something is to change something, but make it as if it was a part of it the whole time. That's why, you know, first line, we, the people, right? that's just as much a part as the very last amendment. Doesn't matter when it was written, it's all one document. Right? God's commandments don't even amend. God's commandments are commandments. He commanded, and then that was his expectation. But it's not a new commandment. Wasn't an amendment, wasn't an add-on or an earmark or a footnote. They say, what I'm getting ready to preach to you, in fact, verse number 6, he says, you've already heard this preached before. He says, I'm just putting it in your remembrance so that you get a burden to do it. He says, because according to God, this is the commandment. Right, well, verse number five again, he says, but that which we have heard from the beginning, what is it? That we love one another. Now you'd think that if there was one expectation that God had for man, that it would be something very profound, something very hard. Well, no, that's the thing. God doesn't command you to do things that you're not able to do. Because if God wrote a commandment that you couldn't keep, God would make you a sinner, not just because we were sinners, but if God told you to do something that you couldn't do, he'd be unholy. He'd be tempting you to do something that you can't do. He would tell you to be something that you could not be. That's why, you know, it's one of my pet peeves, Brother Ron. People say, oh, well, it's just so hard being a Christian. Yeah, if you do it. 
but he equipped us so that we couldn't do it. He wouldn't have told us to be holy if we couldn't be holy. He's not saying be sinless, be perfect, without fault, without error. He's saying live a holy lifestyle. Right? To be separate means to be separate. I understand. Right? All the, the youngins, they want to look like everybody else. They want to talk like everybody else. They want to dress like everybody else. They want to go to the same things that everybody else does. But you can be separate. You can't separate yourself from the world. You can be in the world, but not of the world. Separation is not a list of, well, you can do these things and you can't do these things, and you can hang out with these people, not hang out with these people. Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners, but yet he was separate. Right? Separation is not a list of things you can and can't do. Separation is a lifestyle. Right? You can go to the most wicked part of the country, but if God's with you, you're separate. You're there, but you're not part of it. How else are we supposed to shine a light into the whole world unless we go to the world? Right? God didn't want you boarded up inside of your house like some of them crazy people thought that Y2K was going to happen and there's probably somebody still in a bunker somewhere. Right? That's not how God intended your Christianity to be. God expected you and called you an ambassador. That means you go to a place that is not your home. And while you're there, you're supposed to be separate, you're supposed to be holy. So that people can see by the demonstration of your life that what you have is real and that you're different. That God doesn't command us to do things we can't do. And it's not something profound. Right? It's not that you've got to go out and you've got to do all this penance and you've got to go out and give so many years. The Mormons or the Latter-day Saints, whichever you want to call them nowadays, they teach you've got to give so many years to go to a mission field. Well, if God tells you to do it, Hallelujah. But otherwise, the sound of brass tinkling cymbals. Right? Catholics believe that there's pen it used to, they tell you to go and beat yourself with like a whip until you'd like start bleeding as recompense for your sins. Then they kind of amended it. Right? Again, not one of God's commandments, or else it wouldn't have been amended. And then now you just gotta say so many of a certain type of prayer so many times, and then that's your penance. Or they'll tell you to go out and do something good for somebody else to make up for the bad that you did. That makes sense to the flesh because the flesh understands that you know you reap what you sow that if you've done evil you should do good. God just says do good. He says if you confess your sins he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness but what does he expect? Righteousness. Amen. God makes no provision for evil. He makes only provision for those that follow his commandments. I don't know how we got off on all that. That's not in the notes, but. Okay, he says, love one another. Don't go out and build monuments to the sky proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord whether you build the building or not. Right? He says, this is the commandment that he's beseeching us to this day to adhere to. What is it? That you love one another. And then he doesn't leave it to your own interpretation. Isn't that just like God? He tells you to do something, then He explains you how He wants you to do it. And He says, This is love. Verse number six. That we walk after His commandments. Period. It's right there. That means end of sentence. It means God did ended the sentence there on purpose. Right? There's a whole bunch of Bible corrected. Well, you gotta keep his commandments and nope, God said keep his commandments. That's what love is. Now notice the commandment, verse number 5, was that we love one another. And he says, and this is love that we keep his commandments. The love that you show for other people is found in the commandments of God. Now if you keep his commandments, you're going to have the right love for God. That's where it starts. But if you love God right and you live his commandments right, it's impossible for you not to love one another. More importantly, Brother Bob, if you keep his commandments, you're going to love one another the way that God intended you to. It's all complete. One little tiny package that God gave to you. Because he's God, it's perfect, lacking nothing. It's complete. And he 
into verse number 6 he says this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning you should walk in it okay so verse number 5 he says here's the commandment I beseech you right make it a burden ever forefront in your mind that this is what God expects of you that you love one another and then he says and this commandment that as you have heard from the beginning ye should walk in it it is not a choice you make when you come to church to love one another no it is a walk it is a lifestyle it is a journey that God started you on the path when you got saved and it's not finished until you get to glory it's not subject to how we feel it's not subject to where we are brother Mike or what situation we find ourselves in it's con only condition is that we love him and Jesus said if you love me you'll keep my commandments and in these verses we find out that if we keep those commandments we'll have the love for others that we're supposed to so whichever way you start whether you want to start with well I know that I'm supposed to love one another talking about church members you remember he wrote it to the church that you love one another that I'm supposed to love my church family because I've been fitly framed together in the body of Christ that God put me here with these people because he wants me to outwardly show an affection towards them okay but also that you love one another meaning mankind for God so loved the world what kind of love are we supposed to have the love that Christ showed towards us which is a love that does not distinguish between those that are deserving and undeserving we just love people because we understand that they have a soul which was given to them by God that's going to live in eternity in one of two places heaven or hell and because we love the soul of that person may not love what they're doing may not love the way that they talk the way that they dress may not love all the things that they currently are but I love who God intended them to be and by the grace of God he'll make them into that right I love that person's soul I don't want their soul to die and go to hell but Tommy they can cuss me up one side and down the other still love them now it's easy to say it's a hard thing to do I'm convinced that some, I've been called some things brother Ron that I think they made them up I've never heard them before like movies and TV shows they don't use them Right? and it's hard to turn the other cheek I like an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth actually I'm more akin to you know like instead of an eye for an eye just knock them unconscious right you knock my tooth out your whole jaw's coming off right? that's my form of justice which is why I'm not in charge okay? although I think if we did that there'd be less people walking around poking people in the eye and knocking people's teeth out Right? it's hard when one of them wolves in sheep's clothing says something that bites like venom it's hard not to get bitter and to still love people that you know are trying to do you wrong it's hard to stand there and have a love for somebody that's dear to me somebody that I talk to all the time somebody that you know may be closer than blood with somebody it's hard to have the same love for them and show that same love to somebody that's looking me dead in the eyes and has got me in the crosshairs you say well brother Jordan how do you do it but we can't you could try to in the flesh but you're going to lose your mind but we can't get there I almost said something that's later on hang on we'll get there it's hard to do those things it's an easy thing to say. It's easy. Well, we just got to love other people. Hard thing to live. And what did he commit? That we walk therein. We don't get a get out of jail free card. We don't get to punch in and punch out, and on your lunch break, you get to do whatever you want to do. Right? We don't get exceptions for, well, they just had a bad day. That may be the world's philosophy and logic and judgment. That's not God's. God's is every second that your conscience every breath that he allows us to take 
We're supposed to have a love not just for one another in here, but for mankind. And it is a profound love. It is a love that you can't put words to. You can't explain it. But if you're saved, it's something that you have experienced and felt. And it's our duty to take that love which we feel from God and to show it towards others. And if we wouldn't have been able to do it, he wouldn't have commanded us to. And it's because of these two verses. I've got a few sayings that I've come up with. I think I came up with it, but again, somebody probably already coined this a long time ago. But I've said it for years. If you love right, you live right. So many people are worried about living right that they lose focus on what God said. What was God's commandment? That you love one another. That you walk in that. He didn't tell you to walk in a list of attires that is, is acceptable. He didn't tell you to walk in, well, you got to do this many chapters of the Bible a day or else you haven't been committed to reading your Bible. There's sometimes I can't even get through a whole verse, let alone a whole chapter. God's beating me up one side and down the other just in you know the beginning or the end of a verse. I can't even focus on anything because God wants to deal with me on that. Right? It is not a list that, well, you got to live right before you can start loving right. That's not what God said. God said his commandment was that you love one another. And hear it, or in other words, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. If you love God right, you'll keep his commandments. We've already said, that's what Jesus said. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And you can't love other people until you love God right. Jesus said, you know, the lawyer came and tempted him and said, what's the great commandment? Jesus said, there's two. All the law is fulfilled in this. First, that you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. When Luke all that spirit what's that mean with everything you got nothing is reserved nothing is held back from God God may not ask you to do it but you ought to be willing to do it there's no line in your mind in your heart in your soul that if God asked you to do it you'd say well I wouldn't do that no you're all God but think of the craziest thing in your mind that God would ever ask you to do and then you ought to be willing to do it and then more that's what being holy God's is why because we've been bought with a price he doesn't treat me like a slave he's not my taskmaster he's my savior he made me a brother joint heir to Christ and he's a friend that's sticking closer than any earthly brother but he's not my taskmaster, but he is my Lord. He is the one that is in control of everything. Who am I that I would say, no, Lord, I won't do that. I won't go there. I'll do anything else except that. That's the mindset that Jonah had. He said, I'll go anywhere but Nineveh. Then he got there and he said, fine, Lord, I'll preach to him, but it's not going to do any good. Then he got upset when the whole city got right with God. He was bitter about it. Right, you say, well, that's, that's rough. there's a whole lot of people more bitter than that coming in today because they don't want to do what God's telling them to do. They're still where they started at, but their heart's already been in Tarshish. They've set up shop. they got a whole lifestyle that they don't want to abandon in order to go to Nineveh. Maybe by the grace of God, he didn't chuck them off the boat so that a great fish could come by and swallow it up. But go read the story of Jonah. It said there was a fish prepared for Jonah. God made a fish just for that task. God may not have prepared a fish for you, but he may have prepared a storm. He may have prepared a thief in the night, somebody you never would have seen coming. But there's a preparation made that if we go that way, there's a way that God knows how to get us to Nineveh. It's better just go to Nineveh. Jonah got puked up on the beach after being in something's stomach for three days and three nights. According to Jonah's own testimony, he thought he was in hell. 
that place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth where the fire died not that's where he thought he was that's how bad it was and then he gets puked up on the beach and after I'm sure being about half digested I'm sure he's got sores and blisters and who knows what else all over him then he's got to walk from wherever the fish spit him out to Nineveh and then once he gets there the Bible says he preached from one side of the city to the other but it took him a couple of days now I don't know about you right? even when I'm just doing this preaching pretty stressful Right? and it's not until after brother Ron that we realized how hard we preached and we did I didn't think I preached that hard well I may not have but it is a taxing thing now this is the easy part this is teaching I can do this all day long right but preaching with the Holy Ghost on you that drains you real quick I have said it many a times people say oh you don't want to go shake people's hands after no when I get done preaching I want food and I want sleep that's all I want Right? As long as God said you did good, I'm happy. I don't need nothing else. Just let me go to sleep because I'm tired. Right? Sometimes I don't even need the food. Just let me go to bed. It just wears you out. Now imagine doing it for days across an entire city after you've been in the belly of a whale. You said, well, why would God ask him to do that? God didn't ask him to do that. God asked him to go the first time whole and to do it without being in a fish's belly that was a result of Jonah not of God Jonah had the right love he'd have been long keeping the commandments of God and it wouldn't have even entered his mind that there's something that I won't do for God well what are some of them commandments what it says if you love me you keep my commandments we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart all our soul all our mind we could spend weeks and years going through here on what the commandments are right then we could spend even longer just looking at the law of God right didn't say walk in the law because we're not capable of fulfilling the law he said walk in his commandments so Jesus did you the favor of summing it up love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul with all thy mind all thy spirit with everything you've got you don't limit what God can or cannot do through you you don't limit on what you're willing to do for God you don't limit on where you'll go for God how about this one you don't limit how much you'll care because God asked you to Ted love him with all thy heart well if all of your heart is given to God and God says I want you to go and be a light to that person you should already have a general love for him God's asking you to have a specific love for him you love enough to or care enough about somebody else that after God puts them on your heart you're still praying a year from now a month from now how about a decade from now and not just going through vain repetition but it's still as real and still as much of a burden then as when God gave it to you because God told you to care about that person so you care about that person because God commanded you to but also because you love them the Bible says Jesus is at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession for us he never forgets to call your name out to God well he asked you just pray for one to love one to care about that one person that he gave you a burden for how long does that care last how long does that dedication take before it wanes I get it we grow weary and well doing I get that you have a bad day and it's hard but if in the forefront of your mind is God wants me to love that person today doesn't matter what you go through you're still going to love that person but what you focus on is what is most important to you the Bible says that where your heart is there your treasure will be also but where your heart is there your thoughts will be also where your heart is that's where you walk but says that we're supposed to love our God with all our heart all our heart all our mind soul and spirit everything and he says the second commandment is like unto it he's saying it's not that much different he says that's why I said that there's two great commandments because there's one that's 
talking about towards God, but then he says towards man, we're not supposed to love man with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our spirit. He says, because that's God's. God is supposed to be forefront in our life. Well, if God has all those, we can't give two people all those things. But if God told us to do that, we wouldn't be able to do it. That's why God didn't command us to do it. We're supposed to love God supremely with everything that we have, and then we're supposed to love others as thyself. But what's verse number five say? That we love one another. And you say, well, he doesn't say anything about God in there. Well, who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. What's the church? The bride of Christ. Who's the bride supposed to love? The bridegroom. There you go. He's talking about us being the bride, loving the bridegroom, too. I can break this down eight ways the next Sunday. Right? You can't read this and not see we're supposed to love God and we're supposed to love everybody else with everything we got. But how are we supposed to love others as ourselves? See, that's a, that's a hard question. Because in truth, I really don't care how other people treat me. Man, just being honest. I'm not here for them. I'm here for him. There's only one person's opinion that I truly care about, and that's God. Now, would it hurt if other people said things? Yeah, it hurt. But it's not going to end my day. Right? By the grace of God, it's not going to derail me. But the person that I care about most in the world walks in and denounces me, not a problem. Because I've still got him. That's all that matters. Now, that's easy for me to do now. That wasn't easy the first time it happened. Or the second or the third or however many times we're up to by now. But you know what I've learned? He never changes. So I don't, I've gotten to the point, maybe I'm jaded. Okay, maybe I'm, what's that word, cynical. Okay, I don't expect anything from other people. But that's not how I'm supposed to love people. He doesn't say love as you want to be treated. Or love how you want other people to treat you. No, that's what the world says. That's the golden rule. About do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, if I want people to ignore me, that means that I get to ignore people. That wasn't God's commandment. That's worldly philosophy. I think it comes from either Hinduism or Buddhism, one or the other. No, God says, love thy neighbor as thyself. That means love them like you love yourself. Now, y'all might not believe this. Maybe it's genetic, but I kind of think highly of myself. But dare I say, Brother Tommy, I've been guilty of pride a few times. Okay? Enough that I'd have to take my shoes off to count that high, and then we'd have to borrow somebody else's hands and feet too. Okay, maybe a couple of people's. Okay, we are apt to <clears throat> be prideful. In fact, it's one of the things that God hates. We talk, taught that not too long ago. Right? A proud look. God hates it. It's an abomination unto him. But Solomon, pride goes before destruction, haughty spirit before fall. If a man thinks that he stay and take heed lest he fall, God has a lot to say about pride. You know why? Because you deal with you the most. Does he? If you've got to put up with somebody and you know there's no getting away from them, you learn how to get along with them. Right? Doesn't matter if it's work, doesn't matter if it's life, or that kid that you know used to pick his nose and eat it in school that you had to sit next to because there was a sign seat. Nowadays, they don't even have a sign seating anymore. What's wrong with the world? Kids need to learn that there are certain things that you can't get out of, and the weird people you have to sit next to are one of them. That, oh, you, you, you free range seat. They're not chickens. Give them a seat, tell them to sit in it. This world's messed up. Anyway, but you get stuck with some people. You don't just, but you learn how to get, it doesn't matter how much they get on your nerves. Right? You learn how to bite your tongue. You learn how to make compromises with that person without having to say it. You learn what things irritate them which cause them to go off on you. Right? And you learn to live with them. Well, I'm stuck with me. 
And if I'm honest, if we were to sit down and look in the looking glass of the Bible, there's a lot about me I don't like. Right? But if I get out of this word, the Bible says I'm supposed to die daily. I'm supposed to be crucified with Christ. I'm supposed to kill the flesh every day. But it's real easy to just strike a bargain with it. You don't bother me, I don't bother you. It's real easy to start thinking, well, I, I'm, I am something. I'm pretty good at doing this. Now, humility is knowing your strengths and your weaknesses and abiding therein. You can't be humble before God until you know who you are. But see, pride's not just liking yourself. And pride isn't loving yourself. Pride is when you think more of yourself than you ought to. It's forgetting those weaknesses and only focusing on the strength. Well, see, I like me. I'm supposed to love others as myself. There may be days that I don't think too highly of me, but I get in the Word of God and I find God thinks pretty highly of me. He sent His only begotten Son for me. In fact, the Bible tells me that if I was the only one that ever believed in Him, He still would have done the exact same thing again. Amen. means that He would have been the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world if I was the only one that went to heaven. That means that God cares about me pretty well. Let's take this one step further. Anybody in their right mind, if you were to ask them, well, how do you want God to love you? I want God to love me the way that God's always loved me. Right? I want God to have that agape, you know, that Greek word, sacrificial kind of love towards me. I want God to show towards me the love that God has always shown towards me. But it says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Love others with the love that you expect God to show to you, or that you desire God to show to you. You know who God loves? Those that are busy about the Father's business. Well, what's the Father's business? He came seeking to save that which was lost. You know who God draws nigh to? Those that draw nigh to Him. You know who's drawing the nighest unto God? Those that have the same heart that was in Christ Jesus. The same mindset that was in Christ Jesus. Where do you find Jesus at? Well, if it was the Sabbath day, He was at the house of God. And any other day, you find Him tending to the lost sheep. Giving them everything that they need to return to the herd. And then whether they accept or whether they reject, where do you find them next? Doing the exact same thing. Doing for others what they were incapable of doing for themselves. Now, if we're supposed to love others as ourselves, even if we take it past pride, we all like ourselves, we all love ourselves. It's supposed to be that way. If you don't love yourself, right, we got a problem. We got to get in here and convince you that you're worth loving because God loved you. Now how, you know, different conversation for a different day, Brother Peter, on what is the acceptable amount to love yourself according to God. But we're talking about loving other people. You know why I don't steal from any of y'all? Because I love you. That's your stuff. God gave that to you. I don't want it. God gave it to you. I know it would offend you if I stole from it. I don't want to offend you because I love you. But what do you say? To walk therein. Well, walk in what? That we're supposed to have love for one another. You know why I don't say the things that Josh would laugh at and think was funny? Most of the time, because I love y'all. Don't want to offend you. My flesh may think that, but I don't believe it. In a moment of weakness, I might even say something. Doesn't mean that I believe it. But I'm, I don't want you to offend me. But see, take it one step further than that. It's more than just doing unto others as I would want them to do unto me. I don't want to be offended by others, but you know what I want from God? I want God to be life unto me. Not just to avoid cutting me down. How do I love myself? I don't, I'm not my own, well, the flesh is my own worst enemy. But spiritually speaking, I'm not supposed to cut my own legs out from underneath of me. 
I'm not to hamstring myself to where I can't do the things that God wants me to do. But so we ought to live that we're not a stumbling block to somebody else. That's how the apostle put it. That we're supposed to be stepping stones, not stumbling blocks. Right, but see, when it comes to God, what kind of love does God give? God's love is liberty. It's freeing. It's empowering. If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You're no longer in bondage. You're able to go out and do what you used to not be able to do because of the love of God. So how are we supposed to love others? We're not just supposed to keep from offending them. No, their life ought to be better because we're in it. That's how Jesus loved you. That's the kind of love that we hope and we expect and we ask God for. Well, that's the kind of love we're supposed to show to others. If you have that kind of love towards God and you expect that kind of love from God, that's the kind of love you're supposed to show out. Why? Because God's no respecter of persons. We ought not be a respecter of persons. Now again, it's hard when there's somebody standing right in front of you and spits in your face to show them a love that's supposed to make them better. Now better doesn't always mean without a knot on the back of their head. Okay, Jesus did drive the money changers out of the temple with the three-quarter whip that he made. Sometimes there's righteous indignation. But what's the point of righteous indignation? To show them the error of their ways. Because you love them. And you want to better them. Now I know that of myself, I can do no good thing. I know that anything with these sin-cursed hands, as much good as I intend to do, there's a lot of people that do harm by meaning to do good. Now my faith is not in what I physically can do for them. My hope and the reason I show them love is so that they get introduced to the one that I love supremely. Because he can do something. He can use me to be a light to them. But I'm not the one with all the magic that can make their life better. But oftentimes, it's easy to lose focus of the big picture because we're simple minded beings. And if you're a man, it means you only got a one track mind. Women, I don't understand you being able to do 19 things at once. I can't teach on that. I don't understand it. Okay. But I do understand having a one track mind. What's that mean? Whatever's in front of me is what I'm focused on. But whatever I'm thinking about, whether I'm doing something else, whatever I'm doing, it's not going to be up to my best because I've been thinking about this all while I was doing it. But I understand that. I understand that day after day, you stop thinking about the person and their soul, you just start thinking about the person in the flesh in front of you. You care more about making them happy or making them laugh or cutting up with them then you care about showing them what's going to make them better. Jokes aren't going to help people. Now, a word fitly spoken is worth golden apples and pictures of silver. Right? Sound advice. Or somebody just coming along and picking you up after a bad day. That's worth a whole lot. That may help your temporary, but it's not going to help you eternally. Are we supposed to bear one another's burdens? Yes. But we're also supposed to love them in a way that's supposed to make them better. What's that? That's not what I can do. I might be able to make somebody laugh. I might be able to give somebody wisdom or advice because I understand what the Bible says about something. I may be able to point them in the right direction to get the answer that they need. But in truth, it's not about what I can do for you. It's about what he can do for you. When I start focusing on their carnal needs and caring about that more than their spiritual needs, then I'm not loving them as myself. Because God promised to take care of all my physical needs, but that's because He loves me. We're supposed to care about if somebody has a need, we're supposed to desire as a church to fill it. If not personal, I mean, go and look about how many, they sold everything, first church sold everything that they had, gave it to the church, why? So that they can meet the needs of the members of the church. 
They forsook all so that others could have. Why? Because they didn't want them focusing on the carnal. They wanted them focusing on the spiritual. I understand if your stomach's rumbling, it's hard to focus on what God wants you to do because your flesh is just focusing about how hungry you are. I understand when your heart broken, it's hard to think about spiritual things. And I may desire out of empathy to come up to you and say, hey, I've been there before. And I may desire to comfort you in that moment, but I also should desire to give you what you need to get better, which I can't give you. I don't have that garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I don't have the balm of Gilead, but I know the one who has it. And it's my job to get you to him. You see, that's the thing. I don't know how to use the balm of Gilead. I just know how to receive it. Because he's used it on me a couple of times. I don't know how to apply it. I'm not the great physician. I'm not the one that said, come unto me and I'll no wise cast you out. I'm not the one that can put you on the potter's wheel and mold you and make you. Or when you, the world breaks you, put you back together. I can't do that. But I know the one that can. And if we're being honest, if I'm in that situation, I don't want the guy coming that can just make me feel better. I want the guy to come that can help me. Restore me. Now I'm willing to wait until he does it. I'll sit there with you. And I'll do my best to cover it, but there's not enough anecdotes, anecdotes in the world to heal somebody's hurting heart. There's not enough scripture if they're not willing to receive it to help somebody. The key is that Jesus knew just what you needed and just how you needed to hear it. Well, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to love with the love that we expect, how we would love ourselves. If I'm in control of the universe, how would God love God? Right? How would Jordan love Jordan in that scenario? Well, I imagine it'd be real similar to how the Father loves the Son. And I'm supposed to love others as myself. How do I show the love that somebody needs to get them to God but how do I show it in the way that they need to have it given so that it can be received? You can't go out and tell a six-year-old, start, you know, bust out into a long theological discussion on doctrine as to why what they did was wrong. They can't receive that. Right? God knows how to explain things to you. Holy Ghost is real good at that. Right? That's why the Comforter had to come. If Jesus had stayed, comf Comforter couldn't have come. That's why he says it's better for Jesus to go back to heaven. Why? Because we have the Holy Ghost now. Ever since the day of Pentecost, which was the first day that the Holy Ghost indwelled born-again Christians, ever since that day, God's been right down here telling you what it is that you need to do, and he tells it to you the way that you know how to understand it, can comprehend it, and understand what God wants you to do. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and do the Holy Ghost's job, but the Holy Ghost is going to tell you how to talk to somebody else. The Holy Ghost is going to tell you right, what that other person needs to hear. And the Holy Ghost is going to be there with you as you tell it to them. My faith is not in what I can say. My faith is in that I can say what God can use. I can't explain something well enough that somebody else is going to understand what the will of God is for their life. That's not my job. What's my job? Point them in the right direction. To be that light. Be that salt. To go and show them the love of God that is for their betterment. Right now that's the two categories that we're supposed to love. Who's that? That's the church and then we're supposed to love the world. How are we supposed to love the church? Same way that Christ did. He loved the church and gave himself for it. I firmly believe that if you're not willing to die for your church family, there's something wrong down here. Because that's how Jesus loved the church, and we're supposed to love the church like Jesus loved it. We're fitly framed to get... I'd go through a whole lot to make sure my pinky toe didn't get cut off. But we're a part of the body of Christ. How far would we go to make sure we don't lose one of the members? He's the head. He's the one making decisions. But my right foot, I've never asked it. 
but I imagine it's pretty fond of the left foot and doesn't want the left foot to lose the pinky toe. I can still walk. I can still run. I can still do all those things, with that, but it's going to hurt. And I'm not going to be what I could have been without it. So how are we supposed to love the church? We'd be willing to give ourselves for it. Now Christ didn't just give his life. He gave himself. How are we supposed to love others with everything we got in the church? Now how are we supposed to love the world? We're supposed to love the world for their betterment. It's not meat to take what's the master's and cast it to the dogs. God doesn't expect you to take those things that he's given unto you and spoil them in the world to let them go to waste. But Jesus said, here's the well. The well with living water is bubbling up. But if told the woman at the well, if any man drink of the water which I give, well, he gives it, but how do you get it? You've got to come take it. You've got to receive it. If someone's not willing to receive, that's between them and God. But I'm not going to stand there all day long trying to up the ante and make a better offer so that they finally taste and see that the Lord is good. I was supposed to offer them the same offer that was given to me. Which is what? Jesus loves you. Jesus doesn't care where you're at. Jesus will come right where you are. You don't have to get down to the church house and get saved. I didn't. I was smarter than that. I was at home, so where'd I get saved at? At home. I didn't wait until I got to church. Could have been too late. Got saved on the step going in between the kitchen and the garage. But I wasn't smart enough to realize that if dad left, because he was going somewhere to preach, that if dad was gone, mom could show me how to be saved. No, I just knew dad was leaving and I needed to get saved. I knew he knew how to get saved. But I knew he was leaving, so I knew, nope, we got to get this taken care of now. But I know that Jesus came to where I was, so I ought to be willing to go and love those people where they are. I know that man looks on the outward, but God looks on the heart. I don't care what they look at, I'm going to go show that love to them. But I'm not supposed to waste my life trying to win someone that is rejecting God. I'm supposed to be led of the Holy Ghost. I'm not supposed to try and knock down a door that God hadn't opened. And I'm not supposed to try and keep a door open that God's trying to close. That's called discernment. Now you can have a love for somebody that God doesn't want you to act on right now. You know when God loved you when you were ready to receive it? He's always loved He's loved you with an everlasting love, but you know when he made it manifest? When you were able to receive it. I get Some people have a bad day. They don't want to hear anything about Jesus. They don't want to hear anything about anything. They just want to go home. They want to get as far away as possible from anybody else. Now God knows how to get their attention, but I don't. All I know is when God tells me to go to him. But as a matter of conduct, how are we supposed to love the world? I'm not supposed to treat them any different than I treat you. With respect, with dignity, because Jesus died for them. I don't care what they're smoking on, don't care what it is that they're doing in the moment. If they cross my path, I'm going to treat them with respect, with dignity. Not look down my nose at them, but to have compassion on them, as Christ had compassion on me. Now I understand you can want the best for somebody and if they don't want it, they're not going to get it. Because I understand that, I also know some plant, some water, God gives the increase. If you love somebody, you want to stay there and help them. But you also understand that God loves them more than you do. And if God lets you put the seed, God's going to send somebody to put water. Or if God lets you pour some water, it may not be your job to reap. It's my job to be led to the Father and to pray for that person. Prayer moves mountains. Prayer is what makes a difference in somebody's life. I know that if it's been planted or it's been watered, I'm praying that somebody come along and reap. Lord, deal with that person. 
And it ought to break my heart that they didn't receive. I ought to have a burden for that. Why? Because I love them. But according to God, that's your first commandment. If you love somebody, you're going to live right around them. Because you want what's best for them. If you want to help somebody else, you're going to make sure that you are in the proper state when you show up to help them. That you're prepared. And if you want to bear somebody else's burden, you show up for the long haul. You're not carrying it for a little bit. You're bearing it until the burden's been born. Or until God somebody sends somebody along to relieve you. Because that's how Christ loves us. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.